Hello there, my fellow warriors of iron, and welcome to another episode of your weekly Primark lore. This time it is part two from my Perturabo coverage. Last time we talked about the early days of this Primark's life, how he rose in his way to almost rule Olympia, and his rediscovery by the Emperor. Today we are going to pretty much continue where we left off, and talk about a rather unspeakable change Perturabo subjected his legion to, as well as talk about their brutal and very first campaign as the Iron Warriors. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Perturabo spent some time in the Emperor's company, fighting alongside him and consuming knowledge about the Great Crusade its history, war machines, and operation. Then he was handed the command of the 4th Legion, which bore his gene seed, and the transition of authority to him was swift and absolute. At the time, around 35,000 Astartes of the 4th Legion had been mustered to create his own independent command. Around half again that number was scattered across the conquered domains of the Imperium, in smaller independent garrisons and detachments bound to their watches and their duties. Having instituted a full review of the 4th Legion war record, doctrines and practices, and having compared those with other legions, Perturabo found his sons wanting, and acted accordingly. His punishment was decimation. For the legions failing, all would suffer, and all were guilty. As the Edict of Decimation would state, war is unequivocal, uncaring, unforgiving, and blind. Blind will also be the selection of those who will pay the blood for the greater failure of your record. One of ten in the legion, determined by lottery, was put to death without honor, a deed carried out by each legionary's own comrades with their bare hands. At this bloody edict, some within the imperial court protested, believing that the emperor had handed the power of a space marine legion to a madman. Others, more guarded in their approach, said only that command may have been given too soon to this particular primarch, unused as he was to the ways of the imperium. Loudest of these critics was Robut Gilliman, primarch of the Ultramarines who became very angry at the ignominy of the deaths of other valiant Astartes, warriors alongside which his own legion had often fought. It was a spur of discord between the two Primarchs, that, though later eclipsed by other rancors and feuds among the Emperor's sons, would be one that neither would ever forget. However, all such criticism the Emperor silenced. To those who survived the 4th Legion's self-decimation, the lesson was clear. Such was to be the rule of Perturabo, ruthless and unforgiving, and without favor or preference. Death would be the price of failure in Perturabo's service, and war to him was a binary equation. Their sin was not that they had failed in the Great Crusade service, for by no means that had been the case, but instead that they had failed to reach their full potential. It was not enough for Perturabo that they were merely superior, their fault lay in that among the legions they were not already supreme. Hashtag shaking your head. Perturabo demanded that his legion would be a peerless engine of war, and he immediately set about fashioning it into a weapon that he desired it to be a weapon whose edge he would first test against a cluster of systems at the end of Olympia Majoris. The first major engagement of the 4th Legion, under the direct command of their Primarch, was an attack against a foe who would sorely test the Legion's mettle, and open the campaign to bring the Meritara cluster into Imperial compliance. Taking his newly formed expeditionary fleet, Perturabo drove straight for the heart of the cluster, and the hostile power he knew resided there. On Olympia, the enemy Perturabo sought had been little more than legend. 
The last time the shadow of these legends had fallen on that world, their coming had led to the slaughter and enslavement of tens of thousands before their demanded tribute was paid. These were the self-styled Black Judges, self-appointed arbiters of human purity, life and death. Twisted and withered creatures that had once been human in ages past, they have extended their lifespans into millennia with the help of technology as ancient as it was dark. Now their shriveled and time-ravaged forms were encased in mechanized war machines controlled by cybernetic implants. In order to stay alive, they required regular infusions of fresh genetic material, acquired by an agonizingly fatal extraction process. From their base upon a barren, ravine-hollowed moon known as the Rock of Judgment, they held sway over a dozen human-inhabited worlds through sheer terror. They offered a devil's bargain of protection from Zeno's assault in return for a tribute of the young and the healthy. The fourth legion, reeling from its punishment at its new master's hands, was shamed into a desperate desire to prove itself to its primarch and it would be the black judges who were to suffer its pent-up wrath and hatred. The orbital assault on the Rock of Judgment was a direct and brutal affair. Well defended by laser batteries and swarms of drone fighter craft, and the black judges' own warp-capable battleships, it had withstood marauders and vengeful enemies for thousands of years. But against the fury of the Fourth Legion, it could not prevail. Smashing through the blockade line of warships, heedless of the losses they incurred, with a score of Legion strike cruisers and a dozen battle barges burned from stem to stern, the Legion grappled with their foe at close quarters. They launched crippling boarding actions and barrages of Melta warhead torpedoes at point-blank range. With the line broken, the 4th Legion fleet pushed through using the armored prows of their largest capital ships and the bulwark void shields of siege frigates to weather the storm of ground fire and force a landing. Although their true technology carried with it much of the strength of mankind's mastery over the stars since before the Age of Strife, the Black Judges were few in number, even accounting for the tens of thousands of sable-robed accusators and functionaries gene-bred to serve them. Thus they relied heavily upon static defenses and automated sentry guns for protection. Spearheaded by land raider phalanxes and shadow sword companies, the 4th Legion marched onward, methodically eliminating all resistance in a storm of energy blasts. Behind them came wave after wave of mobile siege guns and artillery whose pulverizing shell fire shattered and brought down mountain faces, burying gun bastions below in choking rubble. Such was the apocalyptic firepower of this rolling advance, that it obliterated the Black Judge's vaunted defenses meter by meter, erasing them from existence. It was when the Space Marines smashed their way into the lightless inner sanctums of the Night Courts, at the heart of the towering citadels of Obsidian, that the bitterest of the fighting took place. Swept by batteries of lethal neutron rays, and assailed by suicidal mobs of accusators, armed with powered chain hammers, the casualties mounted. Once the fanatics had been slaughtered, the leading elements of the assault forced their way bloodily through abyssal chambers of nightmarish surgical theaters. After this bloodbath, they finally reached their objective, a confrontation with the Black Judges themselves. Sustained by their dark science, each of the Black Judges' armored life support system were all but impervious to bolter fire, while their razor scourges and ray cannons made each the equal of a space marine dreadnought. And even worse, there were hundreds of them. Against these mechanized killers, the warriors of the 4th Legion would not give ground, even though the legionaries themselves died in their dozens, cut into bloody hunks of meat or incinerated in the molten coffins of their power armor. The darkness soon became a storm of muzzle flash and thunder, pierced by the screams of the dying and the high-pitched screeching of diseased minds that had lived far beyond human sanity for centuries. As the battle raged on, the legionaries took to using mounds of their own comrades as cover from the sweeping hellish rays, 
and rallied again and again to charge the blackly glittering judgment engines, suffering the black judge's murderous fury to plant crack grenades or discharge point-blank melta blasts to bring the enemies down. For what seemed like an age, the battle hovered on a knife's edge. In the confines of the vaults and corridors, the black judges had the advantage, and for every one they fell, a dozen Astartes also fell to pay the price. It was then that Perturabo finally struck. Having observed the unfolding battle, his superhuman intellect had discerned patterns and vulnerabilities among the chaos and din of war, and had calculated the precise point at which to attack to the greatest effect. The Primarch himself struck the ranks of the Black Judges like a thunderbolt, throwing them all into disarray. Like a vengeful god, he plowed into the heart of them, blasting and burning them, ripping their machine frames apart, and tearing out their withered bodies from within with his own gauntleted hands. As the Black Judges reeled in shock and sought to realign their counterattack against this new and terrible threat, the gears of Perturabo's plan turned and the elite heavy support units of the 4th Legion, already known as Havocs, advanced in coordinated patterns. Isolating and blindsiding the Black Judges, the Havocs advanced implacably, and ended their baleful rule, pronouncing sentence of their own with crossfire storms of autocannon shells and plasma bolts. By Perturabo's design, the enemy was crushed without mercy, and their domains were stripped of every valuable resource and technology. Wreckage and weapons flowed to Olympia, and the Black Judge's long-guarded secrets fell to the newly renamed Iron Warriors and their master. Those secrets were then shared with the Adeptus Mechanicus in return for their aid. With the world stripped of its resources, the orbital shipyards of the Rock of Judgment, themselves relics of a lost human age of conquest, were finally set in orbit afresh around Olympia, and set to work fashioning a new generation of warships under Perturabo's command. In alliance with the Mechanicum, new orbital shipyards and foundries burned with frenetic activity, many having been torn from dead orbits from around conquered stars. The worlds of the Meratara Cluster now too paid their tribute of flesh and blood to the Lord of Iron, to feed the Legion's hunger for new warriors, weapons and ammunition. All of this was by Perturabo's hand and design. In the Crucible of War, the Iron Warriors Legion had undergone a new reshaping. The changes that had occurred were seen in many ways to have amplified what was already present in the Fourth Legion rather than changing them beyond recognition. Where once the Legion had been ruthless in its willingness to accept losses in return for victory, now it was utterly driven to the point where such considerations were beneath it. War had become a deadly equation which the Iron Warriors were supremely suited to solve, a relentlessly unyielding engine of war, a beast of steel and fire, which swept whole worlds clean and devoured whole armies. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Perturabo, the decimation of the Legion, and the campaign against the Black Judges for today. What are your thoughts on the decimation of the Iron Warriors? Do you think it was warranted? Could it have been done any differently? Let us know and discuss in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to help me keep this channel alive, please go visit my Patreon page, the link for which is in the video description. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.